The Mythologies of All Races Volume 3 Celtic Slavic Chapter 13 The Heroic Myths Part 2 Fion and the Fane The analysts gave a historic aspect and a specific date and ancestry to Fion and his men, the Fane. But they exist and are immortal because they sprang from the heroic ideals of the folk. If they were once men, it was in a period of which no written record remains. The main story possesses a framework and certain outstanding facts. But whatever far distant actuality the Ipos has is thickly overlaid with fancy, so that we are in a world of exaggerated action, of magic whenever we approach any story dealing with the fame. The analytic scheme added nothing to the oppose. Rather, it is as if to the vague personalities of the folk tale had been given a date, names, and a line of long descent, which may delight prosaic minds, though it spoils the folk tale for the imaginative. Traces of the analytic scheme occur in the chronological poem of Gilla Kaimhain and in the annals of Tigernach, which regarded the Fane as a hireling militia defending Ireland, consisting of seven legions or Fianna. Also, Fane, literally, troops, each of 3,000 men with a commander. The fane of Leinster and Meath comprise those of our epos, the Clanna Bausigne, its later chiefs being Cumhal, Gol of the Clanna Morna, and Fion. We are told of their arms, dress, and privileges, and of the conditions of admission to their ranks, some almost superhuman and we learn that their exactions became so heavy that king and people rose against them and routed them at Kuncha, where Kumhal, father of Fion, fell. Later his opponent Gaul became head of the fane, and then Fion himself. But as a result of their new pretensions, the fane were finally destroyed at Gabra. Many fane stories are coloured by this scheme which was applied to them at an early period, yet alongside the oldest references to it we find stories or illusions which show that the imaginative aspect was as strong then as it was later, and that an early date there was much Fion literature so well known that mere reference to its persons or incidents sufficed. A recent writer suggests that Fion was originally a hero of the subject race of the Galioin in North Leinster, who are constantly associated with Fridbogs and Fridon Nan. These appear to be remnants of a pre-Celtic population in Ireland and are usually despised for evil qualities, though they have strong magical powers, just as conquerors often consider Aboriginal races to be superior magicians, if inferior human beings. These races furnished military service for the Celtic kings of the district down to the rise of the dominant Milesian monarchs in the 5th century. And of these, Fianna, Fion, whose name means white and has nothing to do with Fianna or Fane, whether he really existed or not, was regarded as chief. Mac Firbis, a 17th century author, quotes an earlier writer who says that Fion was of the sept of the Ui Tarsig, part of the tribe of the Galioin. Kumhal, his father, of the Clanna Bausigne, is represented in the boyish deeds of Fion, a story copied from the 10th century Psalter of Cashel into a later manuscript. As striving at Knucha with Uirgrian and the Clianna Luagni, aided by the Clan Namorna, both subject tribes, for the chief Fianship. 
Only in later accounts of the battle is Khan, the High King, or Ardri, introduced. And though the analytic conception colors the introduction to this otherwise mythical tale, it appears to be based on recollections of clan feuds, especially as Fion himself was later slain by members of the clanna Uirgrian. With growing popularity, he became a Leinster Irish hero, fighting against other Irish tribes, mainly those of Ulster. But it was not until the Middle Irish period that the Fionn story, which had now spread through a great part of Ireland among the Celtic folk, with many local developments, was adopted by the literary class of the dominant tribes, as at an earlier period they had taken over the Cuculain saga from the Ulstermen. They were rewriting Irish history in the light of contemporary events and of their own ambitions and accordingly they transfigured and remoulded the legend of Fionn, which afforded them an ever-growing literary structure. The first service of the Fianna became that of a highly developed militia under imaginary high kings, whence the rise of tales in which Fionn is brought into relation with these rulers, Con, Cormac, Art, and Caibre, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. The Fianna became defenders of Ireland against foreign invasion, the battle with Norsemen. They even went outside Ireland and conquered European or Asiatic kings. In origin, Fionn was the ideal hero of a subject, non-Celtic race, as Cumhal had been, and they were located at Almha, the hill of Allen. They tended, however, to become historic figures associated primarily with the forced service of such a race, then with the later mythic national militia. But despite this, a mythic aspect was theirs from first to last, while the cycle of legends was constantly being augmented. To Oisin, son of Fionn, are ascribed many poems about the fane. Hence he must have been regarded traditionally as the poet of the band, rather than his father, who studied the art and ate the salmon of knowledge. Few excelled in bravery, Osin's son, Oscar. Cawilte Macronen, Fionn's nephew, was famed for fleetness. At full speed he appeared at three persons and could overtake the swift march wind, though it could not outstrip him. The Armide Uiduibne, who never knew weariness of foot, nor shortness of breath, nor, whether in going out or in coming in, ever flagged, possessed a beauty spot, or ball sake, and no woman who saw it could resist the lightsome countenance of yellow-haired diarmide of the women. Goal of Clannamorna, Fionn's enemy, and then his friend, but with whom a feud arose which ended in his death, was probably the ideal warrior, prodigiously strong, noble, and brave, of a separate saga. Connell Maul was also the clan Namorna, and his father raided in slain Cumhal at Nucha, for which Fion afterward put an eric, or fine, upon him. Although of the fane, he was continually rejoicing at their misfortunes in foul mouth language, and his Celtic Thersites, Wrecker and great disturber of the fane, was constantly in trouble through his boldness and reckless bravery. Claw for claw, and devil take the shortest nails, as Conan said to the devil. In later accounts, he appears rather as a comic character. Mac Lugash of the Terrible Hand is also prominent. So too is Fergus True Lips, the wise seer, interpreter of dreams and poet. Others come and go, but round these circles all the breathless interest of this heroic epos. Their occupations were fighting on a vast scale, the records of which, like those of the Cuculain saga, are often tiresome and ghastly. Mighty huntings, watched from some hilltop by Fionn, and described with zest and not a little romantic beauty as the hunt wends by forests, 
glens, watercourses, or smiling valleys. Lastly, lovemaking, for these warriors could woo tenderly and with compelling power. Their vast strength and size, one of their skulls held a man seated, tend to remove from them from the puny race of mere human beings. Yet though of divine descent, they were not immortal, so that Kawil says of a goddess, she is of the Tuatha de Danan, who are unfading and whose duration is perennial. I am of the sons of Milesius, that are perishable and fade away. While the Kukulain legend had a definite number of tales, and after a certain date remained complete, the Fion cycle received continual additions. New stories were written, new incidents invented or borrowed from existing folktale or saga until comparatively recent times. Again, unlike the Kukulain saga, the Fion cycle contains numerous poems, while the former has fewer folktale versions of its literary stories than the latter. The interest of Fion's ancestral line begins with Kumhal. The boyish deeds show him engaging in a clan feud with the Klana Luagni, assisted by the Klana of which Morna was chief. Morna's son Eod took a leading part in the battle and was prominent afterward under the name Gol, or One-Eyed, because he lost an eye there. Kumhal fell at his stroke. A different account of the battle is given in the Liabhar Nahi Uithre. In this, Tadg, a druid, succeeded to Almha, the castle of his father Nuada, who was also a druid. And Tadg's daughter Murne was sought in marriage by Kumhal, but refused, because Tadg foresaw that he would lose Almha through him. Kumhal then abducted her, whereupon Tadg complained to the high king Khan, who ordered Kumhal to give her up or leave the country. He refused, however, and collecting an army, fought Khan's men, including Uirgrian, Morna, and Gaul, and latter of whom slew him, whence there was feud between Kumhal's descendants and Gaul. Although Tag and Nuada are called druids, Nuada is elsewhere one of the Tuatha de Danan, and he is probably the god Nuada who fought at Makturad. While Tag is also said to be from the Sid of Amha, which is thus regarded both as a divine dwelling and as a fort. Hence, Fion is affiliated to the gods, and another tradition makes his mother's father Brecken, a warrior of the Tuatha de Danan. Kumhal has been identified with a god, Camulus, known for inscriptions in Gaul and Scotland, whose name is also found in Camulodunum or Colchester. As Camulos was equated with Mars, he was a warrior god, a character in keeping with that of Kumhal, though if the latter was a non-Celtic hero, and if his name should be read Umal, the identification is excluded. Fion, a posthumous child, was at first called Daimne. For safety's sake he was taken by Bodhumhal and the Liath Luchra, and reared in the wilds, where, while still a child, he strangled a polecat and had other adventures. At ten years old he came to a fortress on the Liffey, where the boys were playing hurley, and beat them. And when they described him as fair to its owner, he said that his name should be Fion, or fair, but that they must kill him if he returned. Nevertheless, Next day he slew seven of them, and a week later drowned nine more when they challenged him at swimming. While this incident resembles one in Kukulain's early career, in other, probably later accounts, the match takes place in the presence of the High King Khan, who called the boy Fion. In the colloquy with the ancients, however, another incident is found. Gaul had been made chief of the Fein after Kumhal's death, and when ten years old, Fion came to Khan, 
announcing that he wished to be reconciled with him and to enter his service. Khan now offered his rightful heritage to him, who would save Tara from being burnt by Aelian Mak Midna of the Tuatha de Danan, who yearly made everyone sleep through his fairy music and then set fire to the fortress. Fion did not succumb to the music because of the magic power of a weapon given him by one of his father's comrades, and he also warded off with his mantle the flame from Aelian's mouth and succeeded in beheading him, so that he was given Gaul's position, while Gaul made friends with him rather than go into exile. In the account of Kumhal's death, as given in the Liabhar Nahi Uidre, Khan advised Murine to go to her sister Bodhmhal, at whose house Fion was born. Later, he challenged Thug to single combat, or to fight him with many, or to pay a fine for Kumhal's death, and Thug, appealing for a judgment, was forced to surrender Almha to Fion. Peace was now made between Fion and Gaul. The story of Fion's thumb of knowledge belongs in some versions to this period. To learn the art of poetry, he went to Phineses, who for seven years sought to capture a salmon which would impart supernatural knowledge to him, the salmon of knowledge, and after he had caught it, he bade Fion cook it, forbidding him to taste it. When Phineses inquired whether he had eaten any of it, Fion replied, No, but my thumb I burned, and I put it into my mouth after that. Whereupon, Phineses gave him the name Fion, since prophecy had announced that Fion should eat the salmon. He ate it in fact, and even after, on placing his thumb in his mouth, knowledge of things unknown came to him. This story, based on the universal idea that supernatural knowledge or acquaintance with the language of beasts comes from eating part of an animal, often a snake, is parallel to the story of Guayans obtaining inspiration intended for Avagdu and to that of the Norse Sigurd, who, roasting the heart of the dragon Fafnir, intended for the dwarf, burned his finger, placed it in his mouth, and so obtained supernatural wisdom. In German tales, the animal is a Hasselwurm, a snake found under a hazel, like the Celtic salmon which ate the nuts falling from the hazels of knowledge. As told of Fion, the story is a folk tale formula applied to him, but the conception ultimately rests upon the belief in beneficial results from the ritual eating of a sacred animal with knowledge superior to man's. Among American Indians, Maoris, Solomon Islanders, and others, there are figured representations of a medicine man with a reptile whose tongue is attached to his own, and it is actually believed by the American Indians that the postulant magician catches a mysterious otter, takes its tongue, and hangs it round his neck in a bag, after which he understands the language of all creatures. When Fion sought supernatural knowledge, he chewed his thumb or laid it on his tooth, to which it had given this clairvoyant gift. Or again, the knowledge is already in his thumb. Kuldub from the Sid stole the food of the fane on three successive nights, but was caught by Fion, who also followed a woman who had come from the Sid to obtain water. She shut the door on his thumb, which he extricated with difficulty, and then, having sucked it, he found that he knew future events. In another account, however, part of his knowledge came from drinking at a well owned by the Tuatha de Danan. Folktale versions of Fion's youth resemble the literary forms, with differences in detail. Kumal did not marry because it was prophesied that if he did, he would die in the next battle. Yet, having fallen in love with the king's daughter, he wedded her secretly. 
although a druid had told the monarch that his daughter's son would dethrone him. Wherefore, he kept her concealed. A common folktale incident. As his death was at hand, Kumhal begged his mother to rear his child, but it was thrown into a loch, from which it was rescued by its grandmother, who caused a man to make them a room in a tree, and to preserve the secret, killed him. When the boy was fifteen, she took him to a hurling match, and the king, who was present, cried, Who is that Finn Kumhal, or white cap? The woman called out, Finn Mac Kumhal will be his name, and again fled, this being followed by the thumb incident with the formula of Odysseus and the Cyclops, in which a one-eyed giant is substituted for Phineas. Later, Fion fought the beings who threw down a dune which was in course of construction, and for this obtained the king's daughter, while the heroes killed by these beings were restored by him and became his followers. Scott's ballad and folktale versions contain some of these incidents, but vary much as to Cumhal. In one he goes to Scotland and defeats the Norse, and there sets up as a king. But Irish and Norse kings entice him to Ireland, persuade him to marry, and kill him in his wife's arms. His posthumous son is carried by his nurse to the wilds, and then follows the naming incident and that of the thumb of knowledge, though here Black Arkan, Kumhal's murderer, takes the place of Phineas and is slain by Fion on learning of his guilt from his thumb. Lastly, Fion obtains his rightful due. His birth incident and subsequent history is an example of the Aryan expulsion and return formula, as not pointed out, and is paralleled in other Celtic instances. In the boyish deeds of Fion, Kruithne became Fion's wife, but in other tales he possesses other wives or mistresses. In the colloquy with the ancients, his wife Sebia, daughter of the god Bod Diarg, died of horror at the slaughter when Fion's men fought Gaul and the clan Amorna. An Irish ballad also makes Diarg's daughter mother of Oisin, while a second daughter offered herself to Fion for a year to the exclusion of all others, after which she was to enjoy half of his society. But he refused, whereupon she gave him a potion which caused a frenzy. Sabia, Oisin's mother, is the sour of tradition, whom a dread changed into a deer. Spells were laid on Fion to marry the first female creature whom he met, and this was Sar, as a deer, though by his knowledge he recognized her as a woman transformed. He afterward found a child with deer's hair on his temple, for if Sar licked her offspring, he would have a deer's form, if not that of a human being. She could not resist giving him one lick, however, and hair grew on his brow whence his name Oisin, or Little Fawn. Many ballads recount this incident, but in one the deer is Graine, whose story will be told presently, although elsewhere she is called Bly. Another divine or fairy mistress of Fion's could assume many animal shapes, and hence he renounced her. Maid, wife of Bersa, also fell in love with him, and formed nine nuts with love charms, sending them to him that he might eat them. But he refused and buried them, because they were an enchantment for drinking love. Another love affair turned Fion's hair grey. Kualenge, smith to the Tuata de Danan, had two daughters, Miluchrad and Aine, both of whom loved Fion. Aine, however, said that she would never marry a man with grey hair, whereupon Miluchrad caused the gods to make a lake, on which she breathed a spell that all who bathed there should become grey. 
One day Fionn was drawn to this lake by a doe and was induced to jump into it to recover the ring of a woman sitting by the shore. But when he emerged she had vanished and he was a withered old man. The fain dug down toward Miluchra the Sid when she appeared with a drinking horn which restored Fionn's youth but left his hair grey while Conan jeered at his misfortune. One poem offers a partial parallel to the incident of Cuculain and Conlauch without its tragic ending. Oisin, angry with his father, went away for a year, after which father and son met without recognition. Fionn gave Oisin a blow, and both then reviled each other until the discovery of their relationship, when the dispute was happily settled. Fionn's hounds, Bran and Sgeolan, were nephews of his own, for Illan married Fionn's wife, sister Tuidin, whom his fairy mistress transformed into a wolfhound, which gave birth to these famous dogs. Afterward, when Illan promised to renounce Tuidin, the fairy restored her form. Fionn's adventures are mainly of a supernatural kind, combats with gods, giants, phantoms, and other fantastic beings, apart from those in which he fought Norsemen or other foreign powers, an anachronism needing no comment. On one occasion, Fion, Oisin, and Cowalte came to a mysterious house, where a giant seized their horses and bade them enter. In the house were a three-headed hag and a headless man with an eye in his breast. And as they sang at the giant's bidding, nine bodies arose on one side and nine heads on the other, shrieking discordantly. Slaying the horses, he cooked their flesh on rowan spits, and a pot, uncooked, was brought to Fionn, but was refused by him. Then a fight began, and Fionn wielded his sword until sunrise, when all three heroes fell into a swoon. When they recovered, the house had vanished, and they realized that the three phantoms were the three shapes out of Yu Glen, which had thus taken revenge for injury done to their sister, Cullen Widemore. In the fairy palace of the Quicken Trees, Fionn defeated and killed the king of Lochlan, but spared his son Midak, bringing him up in his household. Midak requited him ill, for he chose land on either side of the Shannon's mouth, where armies could land, and then invited Fionn and his men to the palace of the Quicken Trees, while Oisin, Diarmide, and four others remained outside. Presently Midak left the palace, when all its splendor disappeared, and the Fane were unable to move. Meanwhile, an army arrived. But Diarmide and the others repulsed it after long fighting, and he released Fionn and the rest with the blood of three kings. In a folktale version, the blood was exhausted before Conan was reached, and he said to Diarmide, If I were a pretty woman, you would not have left me to the last. Whereupon Diarmide tore him away, leaving his skin sticking to the seat. The house created by glamour in the stories and vanishing at dawn has frequently been found in other tales. The Fane were sometimes aided by, sometimes at war with, the Tuatha de Danan, though in later tales these seem robbed of much of their divinity, one story regarding them almost as demoniac. Kunaran, a chief of the Tuatha de Danan, bade his three daughters punish Fionn for his hunting. On three holly sticks, they hung hosps of yarn in front of a cave and reeled them off with shins, while they sat in the cavern as hideous hags and magically bound Fionn and others who entered it. Now arrived Gaul, Fionn's former enemy, and with him the hags fought, but two of them he halved by a clean sword sweep and the third, 
after being vanquished, restored the heroes. Afterward, however, when she appeared to revenge her sister's death, Gaul slew her and then burned Conaran's saint, giving its wealth to Fion, who bestowed his daughter on him. Gaul is here deemed a hero, as in many poems which lament his ultimate lonely death by Fion after a brave defence. In these, Gaul is superior to Fion, and he was the popular hero of the Fane in Donegal and Connaught, as if there had been a cycle of tales in these districts in which he was the central figure. Fion also fought the Muirar Tach, a horrible one-eyed hag whose husband was the ocean smith, while she was foster mother to the king of Lochlan. She captured from the fane their cup of victory, a clay vessel the contents of which made them victorious. But after a battle in which the king of Lochlan was slain, the cup was recovered. The hag returned, however, and killed some of the fane. But Fion caused the ground to be cut from under her and then slew her. This hag, whose name perhaps means the Eastern Sea, has been regarded as an embodiment of the tempestuous waters. And in one version, the ocean smith says that she cannot die until she is drowned in deep, smooth sea. As if this were a description of the storm lulled to rest. When she is let down to the ground, the suggestion is that of water confined in a hollow space. And if so, the story is a romantic treatment of the Celtic rite of fighting the waves with weapons at high tides. When the king of Lochlan is associated with this hag, he and the Lochlaners are scarcely discriminated from Norsemen who came across the Eastern Sea, invading Ireland and capturing Fion's magic possessions, his dogs, or his wife. Yet there is generally something supernatural about him. Hence, probably before Norsemen came to Ireland, Lochlan was a supernatural region with superhuman people. Riss equates it with the Welsh Lechlin, a mysterious country in the lochs or the sea. When Fion's strife would be with supernatural beings connected with the sea, an interpretation agreeing with the explanation of the Muriar Tach. Once Fion, having made friends with the giant Seachran, was taken with him to the castle of his mother and brother, who hated him. While dancing, Seachran was seized by a hairy claw from the roof, but escaped throwing his mother into the cauldron destined for him. He and Fion fled, pursued by the brother, who slew Siachran, but was killed by Fion, who learned from his womb that a ring guarded by warriors would heal him to drank thrice above it. Diarmaid obtained the ring, and was pursued by the warriors, who Siachran's wife slew, after which the giant was restored to life. Other stories record the chase of enchanted or monstrous animals. Oisin slew a huge boar of the breed of Balor swine, which supplied a week's eating for men and hounds. But meanwhile, Dawn, one of the Sede, carried off a hundred maidens from Eod Sid. Eod's wife, secretly in love with Dawn, changed them into hinds, and when he would not return her love, transformed him into a stag. In this guise he boasted that the fane could not take him. But after a mighty encounter, Oisin, with Bran and Skeulan, slew him. In another tale a vast boar, of whom weapons only glanced, killed many hounds. But at last it was brought to bay by Bran, when a churl of the hill appeared and carried it away inviting the fane to follow. They reached the sed where the churl changed the boar into a handsome youth, his son, and in the sed were many splendours, fair women and noble youths. 
The churl was Ianna, king of the Sind, his wife, Mananan's daughter. Fionn offered to wed their daughter, Skatach, for a year, and Diana agreed to give her, saying that the chase had been arranged in order to bring Fionn to the Sid. Presents were given to him and his men, but at night Skatach played a sleep strain on the harp, which lulled to slumber Fionn and the others, who in the morning found themselves far from the Sid, but with the presents beside them. While it proved that the night had not yet arrived, an incident which should be compared with a similar one in the story of Nera. This overcoming of the fame by glamour and enchantment is a common episode in these stories. Allusion has already been made to the tale of the Gilla Daka and his horse. After the horse had disappeared with fifteen of the fame, Fionn and his men sought them overseas and reached a cliff up which Diarmaid alone was able to ascend by the magic staves of Mananan. He came to a magic well of whose waters he drank, whereupon a wizard appeared, fought with him, and then vanished into the well. This occurred on several days, but at last Diarmaid clasped him in his arms, and together they leaped into the well. There he found himself in a spacious country, where he conquered many opposing hosts. But a giant advised him to come to a finer land, therefore Thune, or Land Under Waves, a form of the god's realm. And there he was nobly entertained, the wizard being its king, with whom the giant and his people were at feud, as in other tales of Elysium its dwellers fight each other. Meanwhile, Fion and his men met the king of Sorcha and helped him in battle with other monarchs, among them the king of Greece, whose daughter Taise, in love with Fion, adored him still more when he slew her brother. She stole away to him, but was intercepted by one of the king's captains. And soon after this, Fion and the king of Sorcha saw a host approaching them, among whom was Diarmaid. He informed Fionn that the Gilla was Abarthach, son of Alchad, king of the land of promise, and from him Conan and the others were rescued. Gaul and Oscar now brought Taise from Greece to Fionn, and indemnity was levied on Albertach, Conan choosing that it should consist of fourteen women, including Abarthach's wife. But Abartach disappeared magically, and Conan was balked of his prize. This story, the romantic incidents of which are treated prosaically, jumbles together myth and later history. And while never quite forgetting that Tirfo Tion, Sorcha and the Land of Promise are part of the god's realm, does its best to do so. Several other instances of aid given to by the Fane to the folk of Elysium occur in the colloquy with the ancients. The Fane pursued a hind into a Sid, whose people were Don and other children of Medir. When their uncle Bob Diarg was lord of the Tuat Hadadanan, he required hostages from Medir's children, but these they refused. And to prevent Bob's vengeance on Medir, the sort of secluded Sid. Here, however, the Tuatha de Danan came yearly and slew their men, until only twenty-eight were left, when, to obtain Fion's help, one of their women as a fawn had lured him to the Sid, as the boar led Predary into the enchanted castle. The Fane assisted Midir's son in next day's fight against a host of the gods, including Bob, Dagda, Oengus, Ler, and Morrigan's children, when many of the host were slain, and three other battles were fought during that year, the Fane remaining to assist. Oscar and Diarmaid were wounded, and by Dawn's advice, Fionn captured the god's physician and caused him to heal their wounds, after which hostages were taken of the Tuatha de Danan, 
so that Midi's son might live in peace. Cowilta told this to St. Patrick centuries later, and he had scarce finished when Dawn himself appeared and did homage to the saint. The old gods were still a mysterious people to the compilers or transmitters of such tales, but they were capable of being beaten by heroes and might be on good terms with saints. Even in St. Patrick's time, the Sede or Tuata de Danan were harassed by mortal foes. But old and worn as he was, Kaowilte assisted them and for reward was cured of his ailments. Long before, moreover, he had killed the supernatural bird of the god Ler, which wrought nightly destruction on the Sid. And when Ler came to avenge this, he was slain by Kaowilte. Thus were the gods envisaged in Christian times as capable of being killed, not only by each other, but by heroes. Sometimes, however, they help the fame. Nor is this unnatural, considering Fion's divine dis- <sighs> Diarmide was a pupil and protege of Mananan and Oengus, and was aided by the latter. Oengus helped Fion in a quarrel with Cormac Mac Ott, who taunted him with Korn's victory over Kumal. Whereupon, Fion and the rest forsook their strife with Oengus, the cause of this is unknown, and he guided them in a foray against Tara, aiding in the fight and alone driving the spoil. Again, when the Fane were in straits, a giant-like being assisted them and proved to be a chief of the city. And in a tale from the Dinsentia Sideng, a daughter of Mongan of the Sid brought Fion a flat stone with a golden chain, by means of which he slew three adversaries. Other magic things belonging to the Fane were once the property of the gods. Mananan had a crane bag made of crane skin, the bird being the goddess Ewife, transformed by a jealous rival, and in it he kept his treasures though these were visible only when the tide was full. This bag became Kumhal's. Mananan's magic shield had already been described, and it also was the later, the property of Kumhal and Fion. In the story of the Battle of Ventry, at which the Tuata de Danan helped the fame, weapons were sent to Fion through druidic sorcery from the Sid of Tag, son of Nuada, by Labraid Lamphada, or the brother of thine own mother. And these weapons shot forth balls of fire. Others were forged by a smith and his two brothers, Rock and the ocean smith, who had only one leg and one eye. Whether these beings are borrowings from the Norse or supernatural creations of earlier Celtic myth is uncertain. Fion also had a magic hood made in the land of promise, and of this hood it was said, You will be hound, man or deer, as you turn it, as you change it. We now approach the most moving episode of the whole cycle, the pursuit of Diarmaid and Graine, the subject of a long tale with many mythical allusions, of several ballads and folk tales, and of numerous references in earlier Celtic literature. Only the briefest outline can be given here, but all who would know that literature at its best should read the story itself. Early accounts tell how Fion, seeking to wed Graine, had to perform tasks, but when he had accomplished these and married her, she eloped with Diarmide. In the longer narrative, when Fion and his friends came to ask Rain's hand, she administered a sleeping potion to all of them, save Oisin and Diarmide, both of whom she asked in succession to elope with her. They refused, but madly in love with Diarmide's beauty, she put Gyaza on him to flee with her. Thus he was forced to elope against his will. And when the disappointed suitor Fion discovered this, he pursued them and came upon them in a wood, while in his sight Diarmide kissed Graine. 
At this point, the god Wengus came to carry them off unseen. And when Diarmide refused his help, Wengus took Gwyne away, the hero himself escaping through his own cleverness. Having reached Wengus and Gwyne, whose heart all but fled out of her mouth with joy at meeting Diarmide, he received advice from the god, who then left them. They still fled, with Fion on their track, while the forces sent after them were overpowered by Diarmide. For long he would not consent to treat Grainé as his wife, and only when he overheard her utter a curious reproach would he do so. From two warriors, whose fathers had helped in the battle against Kumhal, Fion demanded an Eric, or fine, either Diamide's head or a handful of berries from the quickened tree of Dubros. But when the warriors came to Diamide, he parleyed long with them, and at last, as they were determined to fight him, he bound them both. Grainé, who was now with child, asked for these wonderful berries, whereupon Diarmite slew their giant guardian and sent the warriors with the berries to Fion. He and Grainé then climbed the tree, and when Fion arrived, he offered great rewards to the man who would bring down Diarmite's head. Uengus again reappeared, and when nine of the Fain climbed the tree and were slain, he gave each one Diarmide's form and threw the bodies down, their true shape returning only when their heads were cut off. Uengus now carried Grainé in his magic mantle to the Brugna Boine, while Diarmide alighted like a bird on the shafts of his spears far outside the ring of the Fain and fought all who opposed him. Oscar, who had pleaded for his forgiveness, accompanying him to Oengus's Sid. Meanwhile, Fion sought the help of his nurse from the land of promise, and she enveloped the fane in a mist, herself lying on the leaf of a water lily, through a hole in which she dropped darts on Diarmite. He flung his invincible spear, the guy Diark, through the hole and killed the witch, whereupon Oengus made peace between Fion and Diarmide, who was allowed to keep Grainé. Fion, however, still sought revenge against Diarmide, who one night heard in his sleep the baying of a hound. He would have gone after it, for it was one of his gyasa always to follow when he heard that sound. But Grainé detained him, saying, that this was the craft of the Tuata de Danan, notwithstanding Oengus' friendship. Nevertheless, at daylight he departed, refusing to take, despite Grainé's desire, Mananan's sword and the Gai Diarg. And at Ben Gulban, Fion told him that the wild boar of Gulban was being hunted, as always, in vain. Now Diarmide was under Gyasa never to hunt a bull, for his father had killed Rock's son in the scent of Oengus, and Rock had transformed the body into a bull, which would have the same length of life as Diarmide, whom Oengus now conjured never to hunt a bull. Diarmide, however, resolved to slay the bull of Gulban, that is, the transformed child, though he understood that he had been brought to this by Fion's wiles. And in the great hunt which followed, the old fierce magic bow was killed, though not before it had mortally wounded the hero. In other versions, Diamide was unhurt, but Fion bade him peace to bow to find out its length, whereupon a bristle entered his heel and made a deadly wound. Diamide now lay dying, while Fion taunted him. He begged water, for whoever drank from Fion's hands would recover from any injury, and he recalled all he had ever done for him, while Oscar too pleaded for him. Fion went to a wall and brought water in his hands, but let it slowly trickle away. Again Diarmide besought him, and again and yet again Fion brought water, but each time let it drop away, and inexorable with the hero as Lug was with Bran. 
So dear my died, lamented by all. The Wengus was too, mourned him, singing sadly of his death. And since he could not restore him to life, he took the body to his saint, where he breathed a soul into it, so that dear might might speak to him for a while each day. Fionn, who knew that Grainy intended her sons to avenge dear might, was afterward afraid and went secretly to her, only to be greeted with evil words. As a result of his gentle, loving discourse, however, he brought her to his own will, and he had the desire of his heart and soul of her. She became his wife and made peace between him and her sons, who were received into the fane. So ends this tragic tale, the cynical conclusion of which resembles a scene in Richard III. A ballad of the pursuit, however, relates that Diarmaid's daughter, Iakthach, summoned her brothers and made war with Fionn, wounding him severely, so that for four years he got no healing. In a Scots Gaelic folktale, Grainy, while with Diarmaid, plotted with an old man to kill him, but was forgiven. Diarmaid was discovered by Fionn through wood shavings floating downstream from cups which he had made, and Fionn then raised the hunting cry which the hero must answer, his death by the boar following. In the Din Centures, this shavings incident is told of Oisin, who was captured by Fionn's enemies and hidden in a cave, his presence there being revealed in the same way to Fionn, who rescued him. Ballad versions do not admit that Diarmaid ever treated Grain as his wife, in spite of her reproaches or the spells put upon him, and it was only after his death that Fionn discovered his innocence and constancy, notwithstanding appearances. In tradition the pursuit lasted many years, and sepulchral monuments in Ireland are still known as the beds of Diarmaid and Grainy. Some incidents of the pursuit are also told separately, as when one story relates that, after an old woman had betrayed the pair to Fionn, they escaped in a boat in which was a man with beautiful garments, that is, the god Oengus. Various reasons for the final quarrel between Fionn and Gaul are given, but in the end, Gaul was driven to bay on a sea crag with none beside him but his faithful wife where, though overcome by hunger and thirst, he yet refused the offer of the milk of her breasts. Noble in his loneliness, he is represented in several poems as recounting his earlier deeds. Then for the last time he faced Fionn, and fighting manually, he fell, covered with wounds. The accounts of Fionn's death vary, some placing it before, some after, the Battle of Gabra which, in the analytic scheme, was the result of the exactions of the fane. Caibre, High King of Ireland, summoned his nobles, and they resolved on their destruction, whereupon huge forces gathered on both sides, and the greatest battle ever fought in Ireland followed. Few fanes survived it, and the most mournful event was the slaying of Oisin's son Oscar by Caibre the subject of numerous laments, purporting to be written by Oisin, full of pathos and of a wild hunger for the brave days long past. In Fionn's old age, he always drank from a quag, for his wife Smirgat had foretold that to drink from a horn would be followed by his death. But one day he forgot this, and then, through his thumb of knowledge, he learned that the end was near. Long before, Wirgrian had fallen by his hand, and now Wirgrian's sons came against him and slew him. In another vision, however, Gaul's grandson plotted to kill him with Wirgrian's sons and others, and succeeded. There is no mention of the High King here, and it suggests the long-drawn clan vendetta and nothing more. Thus perished the great hero, brave, generous, courteous, of whom many noble things are spoken in later literature, but
but none nobler than Cagualta's eulogy to St. Patrick. He was a king, a seer, a poet, a bard, a lord with a manifold and great train, our magician, our man of knowledge, our soothsayer. All whatsoever he said was sweet with him. Excessive perchance as ye deem my testimony a fion nevertheless, by the king that is above me, he was three times better still. Yet he had undesirable traits, craft and vindictiveness, while his final and forgiving vengeance on Diarmide is a blot upon his character. One tradition alleged that, like Arthur, Fionn was still living secretly somewhere, within a hill or on an island, ready to come with his men in the hour of his country's need. And daring persons have penetrated to this hiding place and have spoken to the resting hero. Noteworthy in this connection is the story which makes the 7th century king Mongan, who represents an earlier mythic Mongan, a rebirth of Fionn, this being shown by Cowalter's reappearance to prove the Mongan's poet the truth of the king's statement regarding the death of Fothad Eidglech. We were there with thee, with Fionn, said Cowalter. Hush! said Mongan. That is not fair. We were with Fionn then. But the, the narrator adds, Mongan, however, was Fionn, though he would not let it be said. Other stories, as we have seen, make Mongan the son of Mananan. Of the survivors of the Fane, the main interest centres in Oisin and Kawilti, the latter of whom lingered on with some of his warriors until the coming of St. Patrick. In tales and poems of later date, notably in Michael Comyn's 18th century poem, Oisin into a, went into a Sid, or to Tirnanog, or the land of youth. The colloquy with the ancients, on the other hand, says that he went to the Sid of Ukth Kleitich, where was his mother Bly although later he is found in St. Patrick's company without an explanation of his return. And now Cowalter rejoins him. This agrees with the Scots tradition that a pretty woman met Oisin in his old age and said, Will you not go with your mother? Thereupon she opened a door in the rock and Oisin remained with her for centuries, although it seemed only a week. But when he wished to return to the fane, she told him that none of them was left. In an Irish version, Oisin entered a cave and there saw a woman with whom he lived for what seemed a few days, although it was really three hundred years. When he went to revisit the fane, he was warned not to dismount from his white steed, but in helping to raise a cart he alighted and became an old man. The tales of his visit to the land of youth vary. Some refer it to his more youthful days, but Michael Comyn was probably on truer ground in placing it after the Battle of Gabra. In these, however, it is not his mother, but Niam, the exquisitely beautiful daughter of the king of Ternanog, who takes him there, lying upon him Gyaza, whose fulfilment would give him immortal life. Crossing the sea with her, he killed a giant who had abducted the daughter of the king of Tirnambo, or the land of the living. And in Tirnanog, he married Niam, with whom he remained three centuries. In one tale, he actually became king because he outraced Niam's father, who held the throne until his son-in-law should do this. And to prevent it, he had given his daughter a pig's head. But Oisin, after hearing Niam's story, accepted her, and her true form was then restored. In the poem, the radiant beauty and joy of Tirnanog are described in traditional terms. But, in spite of these, Oisin longed for Erin, although he thought that his absence from it had been brief. Niam sought to dissuade him from going, but in vain. 
and now she bade him not descend from his horse. When he reached Erin, the fane were forgotten, the old forts were in ruins, a new faith had risen. In a glen, men trying to lift a marble flagstone appealed to him for aid, and stooping from his horse, he raised the stone. But as he did so, his foot touched ground, whereupon his horse vanished, and he found himself a worn, blind old man. In this guise he made he met St. Patrick and became dependent on his bounty. These stories illustrate what is found in all Celtic tales of divine or fairy mistresses. They are the wars, and mortals tire of them and their divine land sooner than the weary of their lovers. Mortals were apt to find that land tedious, for, as one of them said, I had rather re- lead the life of the fame than that which I lead in the seed. It is the plaint of Achilles, who would life here serve for higher on earth than rule the dead in Hades, or of the African proverb, one day in this world is worth a year in the Sramandazi. The meeting of the saint with the survivors of the fane is an interesting, if impossible, situation and it is freely developed both in the colloquy with the ancients and in many poems. While a kindly relationship between clerics and fane is found in the colloquy, even there Kewalte and Oisin regret the past. Both here and in the poems, St. Patrick shows much curiosity regarding the old days, but in some of the latter he is not too tender to Oisin's obstinate heathendom. Oisin, it is true, is almost persuaded at times to accept the faith, but his paganism constantly breaks forth, and he utters daring blasphemies and curses the new order and its annoyances. Shaven priests instead of warriors, bell ringing and psalm singing instead of the music and merriment of the past. Yet in these poems there is tragic pathos and wild regret for the fane and their valorous deeds, for the joys never now to be recalled, for shrunken muscles and dimmed eyes and tired feet and shaking hands, for Oisin's long silent harp, above all for his noble son Oscar. Fionn wept not for his own son, nor did he even weep for his brother, but he wept on seeing my son lie dead while all the rest wept for Oscar. From that day of the Battle of Gabra we did not speak boldly, and we passed not either night or day that we did not breathe heavy sighs. One fine ballad tells how Oisin fought hopelessly against the new order, scorning Christian rites and beliefs, but at last craved forgiveness of God, and then, weak and weary, passed away. Thus it was that death carried off Oisin, whose strength and vigours had been mighty, as it will every warrior who shall come after him upon the earth. In others the fane are shown to be in hell, and St. Patrick rejoices in their fate. Sometimes Oisin cries on Fion to let no devil in hell conquer him. Sometimes, Weak old man as he is, his cursing of St. Patrick mingles with confession of sin and prayers for Fionn's welfare and regrets that he cannot be saved. Oh, how lamentable the news, thou relatest to me, O cleric, that though I am performing pious acts, the vain have not gained heaven. Tradition maintains that Oisin was baptized and a curious story from Roscommon tells how, at St. Patrick's prayer for solace to the fane in hell, they cannot be released. Oscar received a flail and a handful of sand to spread on the ground. The demons could not cross this to torment the fane, for if they attempted to do so, Oscar pursued them with his flail. Chapter 14 The Heroic Myths Part 3 
Arthur. Linnaeus, writing in the 9th century, is the first to mention Arthur. This hero is Dux Bellorum, waging war against the Saxons along with kings who had twelve times chosen him as chief. And twelve successful battles were fought, the last at Mount Baden, where Arthur alone killed over nine hundred men. Gildas, sixth century, however, refers to this struggle without mentioning Arthur's name. In one of these conflicts, Arthur carried an image of the Virgin on his shoulder, or a cross made at Jerusalem, and, in Mirabilia, added by a later hand to Nennius's history, state that Arthur and his dog Cabal, or Cavell, hunted the Porcus Troit, the dog leaving the mark of its foot on a stone near Builth. Nennius himself gives a simple, possibly semi-historical, account of Arthur. And the Annales Cambriae, 10th century, say that Arthur with his nephew and enemy Midrout, or Modred, fell at Camlin. Geoffrey of Monmouth, 1100-1154, who reports the Arthurian legend as it was known in South Wales, states that Uther Pendragon, king of Britain, loved Igerna, wife of Gorlois, duke of Cornwall. But for safety, Gorlois shut her up in Tintagel. Merlin now came to Uther's help and by medicines gave him Gorlois's form and his confident Ulfin, that of the duke's friend, while Merlin himself took another guise, so that Uther thus gained access to Egerna. News of Gorlois's death arrived, and the messengers marveled to see him at Tintagel. But Uther disclosed himself and presently married Egerna, who bore him Arthur and a daughter Anne, the former becoming king at Uther's death. His exploits against Saxons are related, and how he carried his shield Pridwen with a picture of the Virgin, and his sword Caliburnus, which was made in the Isle of Avalon. His conquests extended to Ireland, Iceland, Gothland, the Orkneys, Norway, and Gaul. His coronation and his court are described, and how he resolved to conquer Rome. On the way he slew a giant who had abducted to St. Michael's Mount Helena, niece of Duke Hoyle, and had challenged Arthur to fight after his refusal to send him his beard, which was to have the chief place in a fur made by the giant from the beards of other kings. This monster was greater than the giant Ritho, whom Arthur had fought on Mount Aravius. After conquering the Romans, Arthur heard how his nephew Mordred had usurped the throne, while Queen Guanhumara had married him. Arthur returned and vanquished Mordred, but was mortally wounded and carried to Avalon, resigning the crown to Constantine, while Guanhumara entered a nunnery. Geoffrey obtained some information from a book in the British tongue, and some from Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, besides which he must also have incorporated floating traditions to which William of Malmesbury refers as idle tales. The narrative has a mythical aspect and is embellished after the manner of the time. Arthur's widespread conquests and his fights with giants resemble Fionn's while his birth of a father who changed his form recalls that of Mongan, son of Mananan, who did the same, whence Uther may be a Brythonic god, and Arthur a semi-divine hero like Mongan or Cuculain. Fion, who in one account was a reincarnation of Mongan, was betrayed by his wife Graine and his nephew Diarmide, Arthur by his wife and nephew. And as Mongan went to Elysium, so Arthur went to Avalon. Geoffrey, as well as all existing native Welsh story, knows nothing of the Grail or of the Round Table, 
which first appears in Wasser's Brut, completed in 1155. Three questions now arise. Was there a historic author on whom myths of a fabulous personage were fathered? Is Geoffrey in part rationalizing and amplifying in chivalric fashion an existing mythic story of Arthur? Does he omit some existing traditions of Arthur? These questions are probably to be answered in the affirmative. If the name Arthur is from Latin Artorius, it must have been introduced into Britain in Roman times, and hence the mythic Arthur need not have been so called unless the whole myth postdates the possibly historic 6th century Arthur. If, moreover, the Latin derivation is correct, the supposed source in a hypothetical Celtic Arthur, or plowman, or one who harnesses for the plough, falls to the ground. Had the mythic personality a name resembling Artorius? That is possible. And there was a Celtic god, Artaius, who was equated with Mercury in Gaul. Artaius may be akin to Artio, the name of a bear goddess, from Artos, or bear, although Ris connects it with words associated with ploughing. Example, Welsh R, or ploughland. Artaius would then be equivalent to Mercurius Cultor, but the connection of Artaius and Arthur is problematical. In any case, the story of Arthur is largely mythic, like that of Cuculain or of Fion. Nennius appears to know a more or less historic Arthur. But if there was a mythic Arthur saga in his time, why does he not allude to it? Did the ancient traditions to which he had access not know this mythic hero? Or was he not interested in this aspect of his magnanimous Arthur? Still more curious is it that neither Gildas nor Bade refers to Arthur. Geoffrey's narrative became popular and is the basis of Wasser's Brut, where the round table appears as made by Arthur to prevent quarrels about precedence, and it is said that the Britons had many tales about it. Lyamon, circa 1200, on the other hand, states that it was made by a cunning workman and seated 1600, while in the romances it was made by Merlin. Lyamon also declares that three ladies prophesied at Arthur's birth regarding his future greatness, the three matres or fays of Celtic belief, found also in other mythologies. Yet, before Geoffrey's time, Arthur was known in Brittany, with her Britons had fled from the Saxons, and there the Normans learned of the saga, which they carried to Italy before 1180, so that Alanus ab Insulis, circa 1200, says that in his time, resentment would have been aroused in Brittany by the denial of Arthur's expected return. Among the Welsh romantic tales about Arthur, the chief is that of Gulhwach and Olwen, where he and his warriors, some of whom have magic powers, aid Gulhwach in different quests. The story, which antedates Geoffrey, and proves that an Arthurian legend existed before his time, is based on the folktale formula of a woman's hatred to her stepson. She bade Kulwak seek as his wife Olwen, daughter of Yusbadadin, Penakwar, whose eyelids, like Belor's, must be raised by his servitors, though he is not said to possess an evil eye. The quest was difficult. And when Kolwak found Yespadadan's castle, he learned that many suitors for Owen had been slain, for Yespadadan would die when she married, a variant of the theme of the separable soul. Yespadadan set Kolwak many tasks, some of them connected with each other, and in many of these his cousin Arthur assisted him. Among them 
is the capture of the Twerch Twirth, Nennius's Pocus Troit, on account of the Caesar's cum and raises between its ears, which Yespada then desired. This boar was a knight transformed by God for his sins, and to capture it, the aid of Mabon, son of Modron, must be obtained. First, however, his prison must be found, for he had been stolen on the third night after his birth, and none knew where he was. With the help of various animals, his place of bondage was discovered, and he was released by Arthur, whose aid, with that of others, Yespadadan had said that Colwork would never obtain. Arthur now collected an army for the chase of the boar, and this pursuit recalls many stories of Fion. A great combat with it took place, and after Arthur had fought it for nine days and nights without being able to kill it, he sent to it and its pigs, Gwerhir Gwalastwat, in the form of a bird, to invite one of them to speak with him. The invitation was refused, however, and accordingly Arthur, with his dog Caval and a host of heroes, hunted the boar from place to place. Many were slain, but at last the boar was seized, and the razor and scissors were taken. Nevertheless, before the comb could be obtained, the boar fled to Kernew, or Cornwall, where it was captured. Although all that had happened previously was merely a game compared with the taking of the comb. The boar was now chased into the sea, and Arthur went north to obtain the blood of the sorceress Gordu on the confines of hell, another of the things required by Yispadadin. Arthur slew Gordu, and Ko of Prydain, or Pickland, collected her blood, which, with the other marvellous objects, was taken to Yispadadin, who was now slain. In this story, Kulvok comes to Arthur's coat, which is attended by many warriors and supernatural personages, some of whose names, example, Conchabar, Kuroi, recur in the romances or are taken from other parts of Brythonic as well as Irish traditions. The gate was shut while feasting went on, save to a king's son or to the master of an art, an incident recalling the approach of Lug, master of many arts, to the abode of the Tuata de Danan before the Battle of Makturid, all others being entertained outside with food, music, and a bedfellow. Among the personages of this tale who recur in the romances are Kay, Bedwir, or Bedivere, Gwalchmei, or Gawain, and Gwenifer. Characters from the Mabinogion or other tales are Manawiddan, Morvran, Tainion, Talesin, and Cradilad, daughter of Lud. Mabon, son of Modron, is the Maponos of British and Gaulish inscriptions, where he is equated with Apollo. And his mother's name is equivalent to that of the goddess called Matrone, akin to the Matres, whose designation appears in that of the Marne. Mabon means a youth, and Maponos, the great or divine youth. Whence he must have been a youthful god. His immortality is suggested by the fact that he had been in prison so long that animals which had obtained fabulous ages had no knowledge of him, and only a salmon, older than any of them, knew where his prison was. It carried Kay and Gwerhir thither on its shoulders, and when Arthur attacked the stronghold, it supported Kay and Bedwyr who made a breach in the wall and released the captive. Mabon rode a horse swifter than the waves, and he is called the Swift in the stanzas of the graves. The chase of the boar could not take place without him, and he followed it into the Bristol Channel, 
where he took the razor from it. Reference is made to Mabon's imprisonment in a triad, and he and Gwade, whose prison is mentioned in the Taliesin poem about Arthur and his men, with Lir, Lydith, were the three notable prisoners. Yet there was one still more notable, Arthur, who was three nights in prison in Caer Oeth and Anoeth, three nights in prison by Gwen Pendragon, and three nights in an enchanted prison under Lek and Shinment. But Goreo, his cousin, delivered him. Other mythical or magic-wielding personages in Kolwach are now the following. Gwerhir, who could speak with birds and animals, transformed himself into a bird in order to speak to the boar. And Menu also took that shape and sought to remove one of the boar's treasures when it hurt him with its venom. He could also make Arthur and his men invisible, though they could see other men. Morvran, son of Tegid Voil, seemed a demon, covered with hair like a stag. None struck him at the Battle of Camlan on account of his ugliness, just as none struck Sandbrid Engel because of his beauty. Skilty Lightfoot could march on the ends of tree branches, and so light was he that the grass never bent under him. Drem saw the gnat rise with the sun from Kellywick in Cornwall to Penblathown in Scotland. Under Gwadwin Osol's feet, the highest mountain became a plain. And Sol could hold himself all day on one foot. Gwadwin Odieth made as many sparks from the sole of his foot as when white-hot iron strikes a solid object. He cleared the way of all obstacles before Arthur and his men. Gwevil, when sad, let one of his lips fall to his stomach, while the other made a hood over his head. And Yachbrit, Varivdros, protected his beard above the beams of Arthur's hall. Yasikdro and Yasyudid, servants of Gwenhifar, had feet as rapid as their thoughts, and Clust, interred a hundred cubits underground, could hear the ant leave its nest fifty miles away. Medir could pass through the legs of a wren in the twinkling of an eye from Cornwall to Aesgir Orville in Ireland. Guion could remove with one stroke a speck from the eye of a midge without enduring it. All found the track of swine stolen seven years before his birth. Many of these invaluable personages have parallels in Celtic as well as other folk tales, and are the clever companions of the hero, who execute tasks impossible to himself. In The Dream of Ronabri, the hero had a vision of the knightly court of Arthur, different from that in Kovok and found himself transported thither. Arthur had mighty armies, and he and others were of gigantic size, while his mantle rendered the wearer invisible. The story describes Arthur's game at chess with Owain, and how Owain's crows were first ill-treated and then killed their tormentors. These crows are frequently mentioned in Welsh poetry and Arthur is said to have feared them and their master. In this tale we also hear of Iddauk, mentioned in the Triads, whose horse, on exhaling its breath, blows far off those whom he pursues, and as it respires, it draws them to him. He was an intermediary between Arthur and Mordred at Camlan, sent with gracious words from Arthur, reminding Mordred how he had nurtured him and desiring to make peace. But Idawak altered these messages to threats and thus caused the battle. Arthur's court appears again in The Lady of the Fountain, a Welsh tale which is the equivalent of Cretien's Yvain, 12th century. But here again the conception of it is far more knightly and romantic than in Colwoch. 
The supernatural in this story, whether Celtic or not, is found. Example, in the one-eyed black giant with one foot and an iron club, who guards a forest in which wild animals feed. He tells Kynan to throw a bowlful of water on a slab by a fountain, when a storm will burst, followed by the music of birds, and a black armoured knight will appear and fight with Kynan. In these two tales, the following personages known to Welsh literature and the romances appear. Modred, Caradwek, Lir, Nud, Mabon, Peredur, Lachu, Kay, Gwalchme, Owain, March, son of Machion, or Mark, king of Cornwall, and Gwichiver. In the early of Welsh poems, there are many references to Arthur and his circle, as when, in the Black Book of Caer Marthen, 12th century, one poem telling of Arthur's expedition to the north mentions Kay, whose sword was unerring in his hand, Bidwir the accomplished, Mabon, Manawiddin, deep was his counsel, and Lechu, Arthur's son. Kay pierced nine witches, probably the nine witches of Gloucester mentioned in Peridur, while Arthur fought with a witch and clove the Pollock cat. A triad declares that this creature was born of a pig hunted by Arthur, because it was prophesied that the isle would suffer from its litter, and although Cole, its guardian, threw the cat into the Menai Strait, Paluk's children found it and nourished it until it became one of the three plagues of Mon, or Anglesey. This demon cat, which should be compared with those fought by Cuckelain, recurs in Merlin, but is then located on the continent. In this poem, Arthur is also said to have distributed gifts. Lachio figures in another poem, which tells of his death, as marvellous in song and he is mentioned there with Bran, Gwain, and Credilad. The stanzas of the graves refer to the graves of Gwithur, March, and Arthur, the latter's being Anoeth Bid, the object of a difficult search, and Arthur's horse Caval, not his dog Caval or Cabal, as in Nennius and Colwerk, where Bedwyr held it in leash is mentioned in another poem. Arthur's expedition to Anafin in Kulwak, where Anafin is equivalent to hell, lying to the north, is paralleled by another in a Taliesin poem to which reference has already been made. Arthur and others went in his ship Pridwin, or Pritwin, in Kulwak, where it goes a long distance in the twinkling of an eye, overseas to Kair Sidi, for the spoils of Anafin, including the magic cauldron of Pen Anafin, and apparently re to release Gwair, who had been lured there through the messenger of Puel and Pryderi. While Anafin was spoiled, Gwair grievously sang, and thenceforth till doom he remains a bard. But the expedition was fatal to many who sent on it. For thrice Pridwin's freight voyaged to Caer Sidi, but only seven returned. This recalls Cuckelain's similar journey to Scath for its cauldron and cows. And there is also a parallel in Kulwach, where one of the treasures desired of the hero by Yesipaden is the cauldron of Dirinach, the Irishman, who refused it when Arthur sent for it. Arthur then sailed for Ireland in his ship, and Bedwyr seized the cauldron, placing it on the shoulders of Arthur's cauldron bearer, who brought it away full of money. Another treasure which Colvok had to obtain, but of which there is no further mention, is the basket of Gwydnu, for which the whole world might eat according to their desire, this basket resembling Dagda's cauldron. 
The Guinevere incident in Geoffrey is differently rendered in Welsh tradition. A triad says that the blow given her by Gwen Hifach, her sister in Colwatch, caused the Battle of Camlan. And another triad speaks of Medrod's drawing her from, the, from her royal seat at Kellywick and giving her a blow, while he is also said to have outraged her. Medrod at the same time consumed all the food and drink, but Arthur retaliated by doing likewise at Medrod's court and leaving neither man nor beast alive. Medrod resembled Hir Erwin and Hir Arthim in Colwick, who, wherever they went, ate all provided for them and left the land bare. Although another view of him is found in a triad which speaks of the blow given him by Arthur, as an evil blow, and of himself as gentle, kindly, and fair. Guinevere seems to have had an ill character in Welsh tradition, a spiteful couplet speaking of her as bad when young, worse later. Her name means white phantom or fay, from Gwen, or white, and who Ivar, a word cognate with Irish siabur or siabra, meaning phantom or fairy, the corresponding Irish name being Finnabair. And this seems to point to her divine aspect, just as Etain was called Befind or white woman by Medir. A triad speaks of three Gwenvers, all wives of Arthur, with different fathers. But Celtic myth loved triple forms, and the different Gwynvers, Lurs, Manawidans, etc., may have been local forms of the same divinity. The departure of the wounded Arthur to Avalon, though mentioned by Geoffrey, does not occur in native Welsh story. Yet, in other sources which refer to it, there is probably to be found a Brythonic tradition on the subject. In the Vita Merlini attributed to Geoffrey, Avalon appears as Insula Pomerum, or Isle of Apples, where the labour of cultivating the soil is unnecessary, so abundant is nature. Grapes and corn grow plentifully, and nine sisters, of whom Morgan is chief, and who can take the form of birds, bear rule there. These nine recall the nine maidens whose breath boiled the cauldron of Anaphon, and the bird sisters perhaps recur in the Percival story, where Percival, attacked by black birds, kills one which turns to a beautiful woman whom the others bear away to Avalon. In another description, the island lacks no good thing and is unvisited by enemies. Peace, concord, and eternal spring and flowers are there. Its people are youthful. There is no old age, disease, or grief. All is happiness, and all things are in common. A regia Virgo rules it, more beautiful than the lovely maidens who serve her. She healed Arthur when he was brought to the court of King Avalo, and now they live together. Her name is Morgan, though elsewhere Morgan is Arthur's sister, and Giraldus Cambrensis calls her. Dia Fantastica, while William of Malmesbury speaks of Avaloc or Avalo as dwelling at Avalon with his daughters. How close is the resemblance of this island to the Irish Elysium must at once be seen. It is mainly a land of women. There is no toil, but plenty. No sickness nor death, but immortal youth. That the divine women there can take the form of birds like Fand, Liban, and others. They who visit Arthur find the place full of all delights, says the Vida Merlini. And if Arthur went to Avalon to his sister, he resembles Oisin, who, in one account, went with his mother to Elysium. In the Didot Percival, Arthur declares that he will return, so that Britons expect him and have sometimes heard him hunting in the forest. And Lyamon, who lived in a district where Brythonic tradition must have abounded, says also that Arthur, when wounded, 
announced his departure to the fairest of all maidens, Argante, queen in Avalon, who would heal him, but that he would return. A boat appeared, in which were two women, who placed him in it, and now he dwells in Avalon with the fairest of elves, the fays, or goddesses of other traditions, while Britons await his coming. In Mallory, the boat is full of queens, among them Morgan, Arthur's sister, and Nimue, the lady of the lake, always friendly to Arthur. From her had come the sword Excalibur, and her home was in a wonderful palace within a rock in a lake, an Elysium water world. All this points to the interest taken in a hero by other world beings. The identification of Glastonbury with Avalon may be due to two influences. Glastonbury and its tor were surrounded by marshes, which would cause it to be considered as an island. And probably, too, the tor was a divine abode analogous to the Cid, as the legend of Gwain suggests. Some local myth would lead this island to be regarded as Elysium, while in Arthur's case it came to be called Avalon, either because a local lord of Elysium was named Avalo, or because magic trees with apples, aval, or apple tree, like those of the Irish Elysium, were supposed to grow there. Glastonbury as a said Elysium is supported by only another early author tradition. And one form of this had been transferred to Italy by the Normans. For Gervais of Tilbury speaks of a groom finding himself in a castle on Etna, wherein Arthur lay in bed, suffering from Mordred's wounds, which broke out afresh each year. More usually, however, the legend is that of Arthur and his knights waiting, like Fion, in an enchanted sleep within a hill from the time when their services will be required this story being attached to the Elidon Hills and other places. Welsh literature shows that at a period contemporary with Geoffrey, and in manuscripts perhaps going back to an earlier period, there was an Arthurian tradition in Wales which differed considerably from that of the historian and was much fuller. Arthur became a figure to whom floating myths and traditions might be attached and, like Fionn, he was a slayer of witches, monsters, and serpents, so that in the life of St. Caranog, a huge reptile which devastated the land was hunted and destroyed by him. It is certain that before the great French poems of the Arthurian cycle were written, Arthur was popular both in Britain and in Brittany. The outburst of Arthurian romance proper that of the Anglo-Norman writers, belongs to the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century, opening with the Lay of Mary de France and the Tristan, Eric, Chevalier de la Charette and the Conte del Graal of Christian de Troyes. Whence what is subject matter drawn? Some hold that beyond the scanty facts related of the historic author, all was taken from Armorican sources, popularized by contours there. These traditions, according to Zimmer, were originally Welsh, but were brought to Armorica by immigrants from Britain. But others, example, Gaston Paris and A. Nutt, find the sources in Welsh tradition and native Celtic tales, learned by Normans after the conquest of England and passed thence to France either directly or via Anglo-Norman poems. This is supported by the identity of episodes in the romances with those of Irish sagas. And Miss Weston has adduced new evidence which indicates that in Walshia's Percival, the Elucidation and the English Gawain poems, we have a precious survival of the earliest collected from the Arthurian Romantic tradition. Washier de Denain refers to a certain Bleheris of Welsh birth, whose patron was the Count of Poitiers, and to him he attributes the source of his narrative. Bleheris is probably the Belhis 
to whom the elucidation refers as source of the Grail story. The blood hericus described by Geraldus as fam famosus ille fabulator, and the brewery mentioned by an Anglo-Norman poet named Thomas, who wrote on Tristan about 1170. Arthurian romance is thus traced directly to Welsh sources through, its, through this writer, who certainly flourished not later than the beginning of the 12th century. Arthur and Arthur's coat are a centre toward which or from which stories converge or issue, whence other personages are apt to be regarded as more interesting than he or to have a larger number of deeds attributed to them. Conchobar's court, with its heroes, where boys are brought up and go forth armed to their first adventures, suggests the primitive Celtic Arthurian court, unaltered by medieval chivalric ideas. In the Cuculain stories, it is not so much Conchobar who is the chief figure as Cuculain, though he is always in the background. And in this Arthur in relation to Gawain, Percival and others corresponds to him. Arthur has little to do with the Grail, and new important personages, not necessarily of the early Celtic group, tend to be introduced. Gawain was Arthur's nephew as Cuculain was Conchobar's, and the earlier presentation of him is more just than the later. He never returned from a mission without having fulfilled it. He was the best of walkers and the best of horsemen, says Kulwoch. And according to the triads, he had a golden tongue as one of, and was one of the best knights of Arthur's coat for guests and strangers. He had a valuable steed, Dringullet, as Cuculain had two. His sword, Escalibur, Latin Caliburnus, made in Avalon, was given him by Arthur, its first owner. And its Welsh name, Caled Welsh, seems identical with that of Cuculain's Calad Bolg, which was forged in the Sint. One incident of Gawain's legend is his visit to an island castle where are many knights and maidens who can never speak to each other, ruled by a mysterious lady allied with its magician chief, the captor of these knights and maidens, and he who goes there must remain always. Gawain reached it, guided by the lady, who met him at a fountain, a visit which suggests those of Bran, Conla, and Cuculain to Elysium, at the invitation of a goddess connected with its lord. Gawain was given up as dead, and this legend persisted, though he returned to Arthur. Probably, like Conla, he remained in Elysium, so that medieval tradition regarded him as living in fairyland. In a second incident, the other world momentarily appears. Guinevere was abducted by Meliagant, or Melwas, to a castle on an island whence no traveller returned. It was approached by a sword bridge and an underwater bridge, Lancelot crossing by the former, Gawain choosing the latter. And although in Christians, Le Chevalier de la Charette, Lancelot rescues Guinevere, evidence exists which points to Gawain as the real hero of the adventure. A sword bridge is otherwise unknown to Celtic myth. A realm reached by descending into water is known. And Gawain himself came to a palace underwater, where he met with strange adventures. Possibly Gawain, like his brother Mordred, was lover of Guinevere, a situation to which Lancelot succeeded when he was later revolved. The question also arises whether Gawain and Mordred were Arthur's sons by his sister, wife of King Loth, as Mallory asserts of Mordred. This is not impossible, just as one tradition made Cuculain son of Conchover by his sister Dectere. Gawain, in Miss Weston's opinion, is the earliest hero of the Grail, his position as such being emphasised by Wachir, drawing an aversion by Bleheris. 
Percival next became the hero of the quest, then Lancelot, and finally Galahad, who achieved it. Among those who are known to Welsh literature and who appear in the romances is Kay. His counsel was not to open the gate to Culwach, but Arthur said that curtsy must be shown, and he was one of those whose help Culwach demanded on entering. He passed for offering the Kinir Cain Varvak, and told his wife that if her son took after him, his heart and hands would always be cold, and he would be obstinate. When he carried a burden, none would perceive him from behind or before, and none would support fire and water as long as he. Kay could breathe for nine days and nine nights under water, and could remain that time without sleeping while nothing could heal a blow of his sword. When he pleased, he could become as high as the highest tree, and when heavy rain fell, all that he held in his hand was dry above and below to the distance of a handbreadth. So great was his natural heat, which also served as fuel to his companions when they suffered most from cold. These characteristics recall those of Celtic saints, who remained dry in wet weather, and could produce light from their hands, and also Cuculain's distortion and heat. Kay took an important part in with Bedwyr in seeking Olwen for Culwich, Bedwyr seizing one of the poisoned javelins thrown at them by Jesper Dadden. And he was also active in questing for the treasures and reached the castle of Gwernach Gaur, where, as at the stronghold of Arthur and the Tuatha de Danan, None could enter but the master of an art. Kay proclaimed himself the best sword polisher in the world and gained entrance by saying that he had a companion whom the porter would recognize because his spearhead would detach itself from the shaft, draw blood from the wind, and resume its place on the shaft. This was Bedouid. Kay then killed Gwernach with his own sword and carried it off since the boar could be killed by it alone. Kay and Bedwyr discovered and aided in releasing Mabon, and obtained the leash made from the bed of Dillas Varvauk while he was living, which alone could hold the little dog of great. But Arthur sang a teasing verse about this and irritated Kay so much that peace between them was restored with difficulty. At the hunt of the bow, Bedivere held Arthur's dog Cavell in leash. In Culwach, as in the Black Book of Caer Marthen, Kay is not only a mighty warrior fighting against a hundred, but also a great drinker, and his valour as well as his nobility and wisdom is sung in later poetry. In a curious dialogue between Arthur and Ginver, after her abduction, she told him that Kay could vanquish a hundred, including Arthur, while she described Arthur as small compared with Kay the tall. Possibly Kay rather than Melwas was here Ginver's ravisher. In Geoffrey, Kay is Arthur's sewer and received a province from him, while Bedwyr is butler and Duke of Normandy and both assist Arthur in his adventures and are mentioned together. Kay is also sewer in the Welsh romances which show traces of continental influence, Peredur, Olwen and Lunet, where, as in the Anglo-French romances, his boastful, quarrelsome nature appears. He is always ready to fight, yet always overthrown and he is to the Arthur saga what Conan and Brickru are to those of Fionn and Cuculain. Reference is made in Colwach to his death at the hands of Gwuddalk, a deed revenged by Arthur. But in the Welsh Saint Graal, Kay slew Arthur's son Lachiu and made war on Arthur. On Bedouir, Kulwak says that he never hesitated to take part in any mission on which Kay was sent. None equaled him in running save Trich. Though he had but one hand, three combatants did not make blood flow more quickly than he. 
and his lance, which produced one wound in entering, caused nine in retiring. That is, it was studded with points turned back, so that they caught the flesh on being withdrawn. In like manner, Cuculain's Guy Bulger inflicted thirty wounds when pulled out, and reference is frequently made to pointed spears of similar character. Bedwyr is praised in Welsh poetry and is the Sir Bedivere of the romances. In Geoffrey he reconnoitred the hill where the giant was supposed to live and comforted the nurse of the dead woman abducted by him, and he is also said to have been slain by the Romans. Nennius relates that Vortigern's attempts to build a city mysteriously failed until his wise men said that he must obtain a child without a father and sprinkle the foundation with his blood, an instance of the well-known foundation sacrifice. This victim is at last found because a companion is heard taunting him, as the play at ball, that he is a boy without a father. His mother alleged that he had no mortal sire, and the child exposed the wise man's ignorance by telling what would be discovered beneath the foundation. A pool, two vases, with a tent, and in it two serpents. One of these expelled the other, and all this is explained as symbolic of the world. Vortigern's kingdom, the Britons, and the Saxon invaders Giving his name as Ambrose, and saying that a Roman consul was his father, the boy obtained the place as a site for a citadel of his own, Dinas Emris. Ambrosius Aurelianus the Gweldig was a real person who fought the Saxons in the 5th century, and to his history these myths have been attached. In Geoffrey this boy is Merlin, or Ambrosius Merlin whose mother said that often a beautiful youth appeared, kissed her, and vanished, although afterward he sometimes spoke with her invisibly, and finally as a man slept with her, leaving her with child. One of Vortigern's wise men explained him as an incubus, the Celtic Ducius. Merlin told how two dragons were asleep in two hollow stones, and when dug up, they fought, the red dragon finally being worsted. And he now uttered many tedious prophecies, including that of the coming of Ambrosius as king. At a later time he advised Ambrosius, who wished to erect a memorial for native heroes, to send for the giant's dance to Ireland, whither African giants had carried it. And by Merlin's ingenuity, the stones, which had healing and magic virtues, were removed to Stonehenge. Geoffrey then recounts how Merlin transformed Uther so that he might gain access to Egerna. In Welsh literature, Merlin or Myrdin is connected with the Britons of the North. Whether this Merlin is the same as Geoffrey's is uncertain, the former being called Merlin the Wild or Caledonius but at all events, the two are combined in later literature. He is a bard and prophet who fled frenzied to the Caledonian forest after learning of his sister's son's death. And there he prophesied to his pig under an apple tree and had a friend, Chwimbian, the Vivian of Romance. The later chroniclers and romantic accounts develop Merlin's magic. Example, his shape-shifting, the removal of the stones here is becoming supernatural, while his birth is ascribed to demonic power, and but for his baptism he would have been a kind of antichrist. He took the child Arthur, and when, as king, Arthur unwittingly had an amour with his sister, he appeared as a child and revealed the secret of the king's birth, after which, as an old man, he disclosed to Arthur how he had sinned with his sister in ignorance. In the triads, he and his nine bards went into the sea in a glass house, or he took with him the treasures of Britain to the Isle of Bardsey. In other accounts, however, 
His disappearance was caused by his fairy minstress's treachery, for she learned the secret of his magic power and how to imprison a man in a warless tower, in which she shut him up, visiting him daily. It appeared while it appeared to others as a smoke of mist. Another version describes him as enclosed in a rocky grave, whence perhaps the phrase of a Welsh poem, the man who speaks from the grave, and in yet another tradition, he retires from the world in an esplumneor, which he made himself. How much of this all is pure romance, how much is genuine Brythonic myth, is uncertain. And Merlin may be an old god deg degraded to a mere magician. Nennius and Geoffrey in their narratives suggest the well-known expulsion and return formula. The boy without a father, taunted when playing at ball, comes into favour because he shows why a castle cannot be built. This recalls Fionn's youth and how, overcoming the beings who destroyed the dune, he thus regained his heritage. Merlin's father was doubtless a god, but as the son without a father, he recalls the son of a sinless couple in the story of Bekuma, as well as Oengus, who was taunted with having no known father. The incident of his disappearance of his own will suggest the legends of heroes sleeping in hills, just as his imprisonment by his mistress recalls that of Kronos in the British myth cited by Plutarch and the stories of mortals bound by the love of immortals to the other world. While Merlin is connected with Arthur in Geoffrey and the Romances, he is not one of the throng around the hero in Kulwoch. The debatable ground of the Grail romances cannot be discussed here in detail, especially as the episode did not enter into the earliest perceivable romances of Welsh origin and is lacking in the Welsh Peridur, written in full knowledge of the Percival Grail stories, and in the English Sir Percival. Percival probably succeeded Gawain as the hero of the Grail, to be superseded himself by Galahad. In Wachir's continuation of Christian's perceval, Gawain rode beyond Arthur's kingdom through a wasteland to a castle by the sea, where he saw a knight on a bier with a sword on his breast. A procession of clergy, singing the Vespers of the Dead, entered, and then follows a feast at which a rich grail provided the food and served the guests, upheld by none. Later Gawain saw a lance with a stream of blood flowing from it into a silver cup. And finally the king of the castle entered and bade Gawain fix the two halves of a broken sword together. Unable to do this, he failed in the quest. But having asked about lance and sword, he learned that the lance was that by which Christ's side was pierced while the sword was that of the Dolores Stroke, by which Logris and all the country was destroyed. Here Gawain fell asleep, and next morning found himself on the shore, while the castle had vanished. Nevertheless, the land was now fertile, because he had asked about the lands. Had he asked about the grail, it would have been fully restored. In Christian's perceval, there is a procession with a sword, a lance from which a drop of blood runs down, the grail, shining so as to put out the candle's light, and finally a maiden with a silver plate. The grail is of gold and precious stones, but in other versions it is the dish or cup of the Last Supper, a vessel in which Joseph received the Saviour's blood, or a chalice, or a reliquary, or even something of no material substance or a magic stone. It provides food magically, with the taste which each one would desire, though sometimes it feeds those only who are not in sin. It gives perfume and light, heals the wounded, and, after the successful quest, 
removes barrenness from the land and cures its guardian or raises him from death. It prevents those who set it from being deceived or made to sin by devils, or it gives the seeker spiritual insight. In Peridur there is no grail, but the hero sees a procession with a spear from which come three drops of blood, and a salver containing a head. The grail and its accompanying objects have a twofold aspect and source, pagan and Christian. The grail and lance are associated with events of Christian history, but they have pagan Celtic parallels. The divine cauldron, from which none goes unsatisfied, and which restores the dead, the enchanted cup and tails of Fion, which heals or gives whatever taste is desired to him who drinks from it, and which is sometimes the object of a quest. The head in Peridur recalls Brand's head, the lance and sword, the spear which slew him, and the sword by which he was decapitated, as well as Luke's unconquerable spear, Nuada's irresistible sword, Mananan's magic sword, Tethra's talking sword. The sound of fall suggests the grail as a stone, and it, like Dagda's cauldron and the spear and swords of Lug, Nuada and Mananan, belong to the Tuatha de Danan. The grail, sword and spear have affinity with these as much as with the Christian symbols. Yet no theory quite accounts for the assimilation of two groups, and while the grail has the magic properties, we should remember that miraculous blood-producing and healing of the sick were works of our Lord, which might easily be associated with objects connected with him, as a result of the belief in relics. Failing to discovery of an early manuscript in which the actual sources of the Grail story may be found, much is open to conjecture. A theory connected with the prevailing study of vegetation rituals sees in the objects and their effects survivals of Celtic ritual resembling that of Adonis or Tammuz, its aim being the preservation of the fertility of the land. There is no evidence, however, that at such rituals a miraculous food-supplying vessel had any part. Such vessels belong to the domain of myth, and the story of the grail has more the appearance of being derived from a myth which was possibly based on such rituals. It is in myth that magical miraculous powers flourish, not in ritual, and such a myth could be Christianized. When, moreover, the theory makes the further assumption that the ritual was of the nature of a mystery. There is again no evidence for this, for vegetation rituals are open to all in the fields, even when Christianity has been adopted. The theory, however, postulates a mystery cult, with a plain and evident meaning for the folk, associated with powers of life and generation, and with other significations for their initiate, phallic, philosophic, spiritual. The story of this pagan mystery, which expressed three planes or worlds, the triple mysteries of a life cult, was gradually Christianized by those ignorant of its meaning and was finally worked up by Robert de Baron, 12th century, in terms of a corresponding traditional esoteric Christian mystery. The procession with grail etc. was the presentation of the mystery, its meaning being divulged according to the degree of initiation. But though the quester is the initiate, yet he fails in his quest. The present writer is wholly unable to believe that such mysteries and initiations existed among the barbarous Celts, or that they survived until the early Middle Ages, or that lance and cup have a phallic significance life symbols of the lowest plane, or that there was a traditional esoteric Christianity, save in the minds of cranks of all ages. Why again should the mystery known only to initiates have been the subject of a story? Were initiates likely to reveal it? To regard the grail story from a phallic occult point of view and to interpret it by means of a mystery jargon is to degrade it. 
If the modern occultist possesses a divine secret, the world does not seem to be much the better for it. And such secrets are apt to be mere gas and gaiters. The truth is that occultism renders squalid whatever it touches, be that Christianity or Buddhism, or the romantic stories of the Grail. In spite of the numerous and important characters who enter into the saga, Arthur is the central figure, the ideal hero of Brythonic tribes in the past, to whom leadership at home and abroad might be assigned, and whose presence in all battles might be asserted. Originating as a champion, real or mythical, of northern Brythons in southern Scotland, his legend passed with emigrants to Wales, where it became popular. Like Fionn among the Goidels, so Arthur among the Brythons was located in every district, as numerous place names show. And if Fionn was at first a non-Celtic hero adopted by Goidels, so Arthur was a Brythonic hero adopted by Anglo-Normans as the truest romantic figure. Chapter 15 Paganism and Christianity Apart from the occasional Christianizing of myths or the interpolation of Christian passages in order to make the legends less objectionable, the Irish scribes frequently created new situations or invented tales in which mythical personages were brought into contact with saints and missionaries, as many examples have shown. In doing this, they not only accepted the pagan stories or utilized their conceptions, but sometimes almost contrasted Christianity unfavorably with the older religion. The idea of the immortality or rebirth of the god survived with the tales in which it was embodied and was sometimes utilized for a definite purpose. The fable of the coming of Caesar, Noah's granddaughter, to Ireland before the flood, was the invention of a Christian writer and contradicted those passages which said that no one had ever been in Ireland previous to the deluge. All her company perished, save Fintain, and he was said to have survived until the 6th century of our era. The reason for imagining such a long-lived personage is obvious. In no other way could Cezay's coming, or that of Bertholin, and of the other folk who reached Ireland, have been known. Poems were ascribed to Fintain, in which he recounted the events seen in his long life, until at last he accepted the new faith. Even at this early period, however, there was a story of another long-lived personage with incidents derived from pagan myths. Long life, excessive as Fintain's was, might have been suggested from Genesis, but the successive transformations of Tuan Makedil could have their origin only in myth. And the wonder is such that such a doctrine was accepted by Christian scribes. Tuan was Partholan's nephew, and through centuries was the sole survivor of his race, which was tragically swept away by pestilence in one week for the sins of Partholan. Obtaining entrance to the fortress of a great warrior by the curious but infallible process of fasting against him, Saint Finnan was told by his involuntary host that he was Tuan Makedil, and that he had been a witness of all events in Ireland since the days of Partholin. When he was old and decrypt, he found on awaking one morning that he had become a stag, full of youth and vigour. This was in the time of Nemed, and he described the coming of the Nemedians. He himself, as a stag, had been followed by innumerable stags, which recognised him as their chief. But again he became old, and now after a night's sleep, he awoke as a boar in a youthful strength, and became king of the boars. Similarly he became a vulture, then a salmon, in which form he was caught by fishes and taken to the house of King Karel, whose wife ate him, so that from her he was reborn as a child. While in her womb he heard the conversations which went on, 
and knowing what was happening, he was a prophet when he grew up, and in St. Patrick's time was baptized. Although he had professed knowledge of God, while yet paganism alone existed in Ireland. The mythical donnies of the story are sufficiently obvious. Metamorphosis and rebirth have frequently been found in the myths already cited, and these were used by the inventors of Tuan Macairil, the closest parallels to him being the two swineherds and Guayan. The conversion of pagan heroes or euhemerized divinities to Christianity is sometimes related. When Oengus took Elkmar Sid, the latter steward continued in his office and his wife became the mother of a daughter, Ethne, afterward attendant to Mananan's daughter, Kurkog, who was born at the time the same as she. Ethne was found to be eating none of the divine pigs nor drinking Goibnu's beer, yet she remained in health. A grave insult had been offered to her by a god, and now she could not eat, but an angel sent from God kept her alive. Meanwhile, Oengus and Mananan brought cows from India, and as their milk had none of the demoniac nature of the god's immortal food, Ethne drank it and was nourished for 1500 years until St. Patrick came to Ireland. One day she went bathing with Kurkog and her companions, but she returned no more to the Sid with them, for through the power of Christianity in the land, she had laid aside with her garments the charm of invisibility, the faith fiada. She could now be seen by men and could no longer perceive her divine companions or the road to the invisible Sid. Wandering in search of them, she found a monk seated by a church, and to him she narrated her story. Whereupon he took her to St. Patrick, who baptized her. One day, as she sat by the door of the church, she heard the cries of the invisible Sid folk searching for her and bewailing her. She fainted and now fell into a decline, dying with her head on the saint's breast. In this tale, the general Christian attitude to the gods obtrudes itself. Although the conception of their immortality and invisibility is accepted, they are demons or attended by these. Ethne had a demon guardian who left her when the angel arrived and as a, and as a result of her chastity. Not unlike the story is that of Liban, daughter of Eochaid, whose family was drowned by the bursting of a well. Liban and her lapdog were preserved for a year in the water, but then she was changed into a salmon, save her head, and her dog into an otter. After three hundred years she was caught by her own wish and was baptized by Saint Congo, dying thereafter. In the Kukulain saga, Conchubar was born at the hour of Christ's nativity, and Cathbad sang beforehand a prophecy of the two birds, telling also how Conchubar would find his death in avenging the suffering god, though the hero did not pass away until he had believed in God, before the faith had yet reached Erin. He is said to have been the first pagan who went thence to heaven though not till after his soul had journeyed to hell, whence it was carried with other souls by Christ and the harrowing of Hades, he having died just after the crucifixion. Cuckolain was a pagan to the last, but coincidentally with his passing thrice fifty queens, who loved him, saw his soul floating in a spirit chariot over Emain Macha, singing a song of Christ's coming, the arrival of Patrick, and the shaven monks, and the day of the doom. Loigade, king of Erin, refused to accept the faith unless Patrick called up Cuculain in all his dignity, and next day Loigard told how, after a piercing wind from hell preceding the hero's coming, while the air was full of birds, the swords thrown up by Cuculain's chariot horses, he had appeared as of old. He was, in bodily form, more than a phantom, agreeably to the Celtic conception of immortality. 
and he was clad as a warrior, while his chariot was driven by Loeg and drawn by his famous steeds. Loegaid now desired that Cuculain should return and converse longer with him, whereupon he again appeared, performing in mid-air his supernatural feats and telling of his deeds. He besought Patrick to bring him with his faithful ones to paradise and advised Loegaid to accept the faith. The king now asked Cuculain to tell of his adventures, and he did so, finishing by describing the pains of hell, still urging Loegaid to become a Christian, and again begging the saint to bring him and his to paradise. Then heaven was declared for Cuculain, and Loegaid believed. Some of the feigned stories also show this kindly attitude toward the old paganism, especially the colloquy with the ancients, which dates from the 13th century. When Oisin had gone to the Sint, Kawilte with 18 others survived long enough to meet St. Patrick and his clerics. These were astonished at the tall men with their huge wolf dogs. But the saints sprinkled holy water upon them and dispersed into the hills the legions of demons who floated above them. At Patrick's desire, Kaowilta showed him a spring and told him stories of the fane, the saint interjecting the words, Success and benediction, Kaowilta. This is to me a lightning of spirit and mind. Although he feared that it might be a destruction of devotion and prayer. During the night, however, his guardian angels bade him write down all the stories which Kaowilta told. And next morning, Kawilte and his friends were baptized. The hero gave Patrick mass of gold, Fion's last gift to him, as a fee for the right, and for my soul's and my commander's soul's wheel. And the saint promised him eternal happiness and the benefit of his prayers. The colloquy describes journeys taken by Patrick and his followers with the fame, while Kawilte tells stories of occurrences at various spots. He also relates how Fion, through his thumb of knowledge, understood the truth about God, asserted his belief in him, and foretold the coming of Christian missionaries to Ireland and the celebration of Mars there, adding that for this God would not suffer him to fall into eternal woe. The Fane likewise understood of God's existence and of his rule over all because of certain dire events which befell many revelers in one night, a parallel to this being found in the children of Lair, where, through their sorrows, these children are led to believe in God and in the solace which would come from him. So that in the sequel they received baptism after they had resumed human form. Akin to these meetings of saints and heroes is one which is referred to in some verses from a 14th century manuscript and which concerns St. Columba and Mongan, either the pagan king of that name or his mythic prototype. Like Mananan, whose son he was, he was associated with Elysium, the land with living heart, and from that flock-abounding land of promise he came to converse with the saint. Another poem gives Mongan's greeting to Columba on that occasion, and nothing could exceed the gracious terms in which he praises him. While a third poem tells how Mongan went to heaven under the protection of the saint, his head, great the prophet, under Columxil's cowl. Not the least interesting aspect of the reverence with which Christian scribes and editors regarded old mythic heroes is found in the prophecies of Christianity put into their mouths. Some instances of this have been referred to, but a notable example occurs in the voyage of Bran, where the goddess who visits Bran tells how a great birth will come in after ages. The son of a woman whose mate will not be known, he will seize the rule of many thousands. Tis he that made the heavens, happy he that has a white heart. He will purify hosts under pure water. Tis he 
that will heal your sicknesses. So too, Mananan speaks of the fall and prophecies how a noble salvation will come from the king who has created us. A white law will come over the seas. Besides being God, he will be man. By such means, which recall the noble teaching of Saint Clement and Origen, did Christian Celts make gods and heroes do homage to the new faith, while yet they recounted the mythic stories about them and preserved all the tender grace of a day that is dead. Even more remarkable is one version of a story telling how the narrative of the Tain was recovered. It existed only in fragments until Fergus MacRoich, a hero of the Cook Lane group, rose from his grave and recited it, appearing not only to the poets, but to saints of Erin who had met near his tomb, while no less a person than Saint Ciaran wrote the story to his dictation. Among these saints were Columba, Brendan and Caelin, and in company with Sension and other poets, they were fasting at the grave of Fergus so that he might appear, after which the tale was written down in Ciaran's Book of Cowhide. The same charitable point of view is seen in the fact that the gods and heroes still have their own mystic world in the Sid and are seldom placed in hell. Yet there are exceptions, for Cuculain came from hell, as we saw, but St. Patrick transferred him to heaven. Even in hell, however, he had still been the triumphant hero, and when the demons carried off his soul to the red charcoal, he played his sword and his guy Bolga on them, as Oscar did his flail, so that the devil suffered, even while they crushed him into the fire. Cowilta craved that his sister might be brought out of hell, and Patrick said that if this were good in God's sight, she and also his father, mother, and Fion himself would be released. In other poems, however, the Fain are and remain in hell, as has already been seen. Thus, while the church set its face against the old cults, so that only slight traces of these remain, or give a Christian aspect to popular customs by connecting them with saints, days or sacred places, it was on the whole rather proud than otherwise of the heroes of the past and preserved their memory, together with much of the gracious aspect of the ancient gods. Exceptions to this exist and were bound to exist. Example, in many Irish and Scots oceanic ballads. And there was, too, a tendency to confuse Elysium with hell, more especially in Welsh legend, this being inevitable where myths of Elysium were still connected with the local cult. Gwain was Lord of Anifin, which was located on Glastonbury Tor, or King of Fairyland, and here St. Colin was invited to meet him. Seeing a wonderful castle and a host of beautiful folk, he regarded them as devils the splendid robes as flames of fire, the food as withered leaves. And when he threw holy water on them, everything vanished. Probably a cult of Gwain existed on the hill. Gwain was also thought to be a hunter of wicked souls. Yet it is also said of him that God placed in him the force of the demons of Anaphin in order to hinder them from destroying the people of this world. We owe much to the Christian scribes and poets of early medieval Ireland and Wales, who wrote down or re-edited the mythic tales, romantic legends, and poems of the pagan period, thus preserving them to us. They had still existed among the folk, or were current in the literary class, and that they were saved from destruction is probably due to the fact that Ireland and Wales were never Romanized. Causes were at work in Gaul which killed the myths and tales so long transmitted in oral forms. And since they were never written down, they perished. Elsewhere these causes did not exist, or a type of Christianity flourished which was not altogether hostile to the stories of olden time, as when Irish paganism itself was described symbolically 
as desiring the dawn of a new day. The birds of Elysium were the bird flock of the land of promise, and in one story were brought into contact with Saint Patrick, welcoming him, churning the water into milky whiteness, and calling, O help of the girls, come, 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 and come hither. That is an exquisite fancy, more moving even than that which told how the lonely mountains over and the resounding shore, a voice of weeping heard and loud lament. The mournful cry, Great Pan is dead, at the moment of Christ's nativity. Celtic paganism, Goidelic and Brythonic, surely bestowed on Christianity much of its old glamour, for nowhere is the history of the Church more romantic than in those regions where Ninian and Columba and Kentigern and Patrick lived and laboured long ago. The End <laughs>